Good afternoon, everybody. And I'm very happy to introduce you to Gemman Sumbre. He did his PhD here in the Hebrew University under the supervision of Benny Ofner. Actually, I, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Anna, and I'm post talking at Benny's lab. That's why they asked me to introduce him. And, um, uh, and then after his PhD here in Hebrew University, he did his postdoc with Mu Ping Fu in Berkeley. I hope I didn't, yeah, it's uh, quite difficult. And today he's the director of research in the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris. And his research, his user, he uses zebrafish to achieve a better understanding of the neural mechanism of sensory perception and as a means of providing new insights into, into neurological disorders. And today, today's talk is titled Ongoing Spontaneous Activity Dynamics of, of Large Neural Networks in Zebrafish Lava. So, please, German. So thank you for the invitation and being here. I, I'm, uh, I'm very glad to be here and see uh, many people that were part of my life a long time ago. And uh, well, yeah. here. Okay. okay. So in the lab, uh, we are uh, working on uh, trying to record neural circuits, uh, large neural circuits, so around 1,000 cells at the same time, to try. The, try to understand what are the uh, mechanisms that control motor behavior and single uh, cognitive functions. And we are doing this uh, by uh, using the zebra fish as the larva model, as uh, the experimental model, which is a small uh, vertebrate, only uh, four millimeters or three millimeters in length and 300 microns in thickness, which is ideal uh, for genetic manipulations its genome is known. Uh, it has a vast variety of transgenic fish, uh, also mutants, and very uh, a large number of known promoters. And we are using specifically for uh, label uh, specific cells, uh, express genetic encoded, uh, encoded calcium indicators, just as chicken 3 for example, and use optogenetics. It has at this a very early stage a large repertoire of motor behaviors already, and uh, the transparency of the skin and the small size enables to monitor the activity of large neural networks in a, a really or true intact uh, vertebrate during behavior. More specifically, we are using a larvae, uh, a larva that is expressing uh, GCAM3 uh, uh, protein. Uh, under the control of a QC promoter, it's a pan-neuronal promoter, as you can see from this image, uh, taken with the epifluorescent microscope, you can see the expression of the protein uh, along the entire nervous system. And in combination with two-photon image, imaging, uh, we can see pictures more or less like this of the uh, expressed protein, where we can see large parts parts of the brain, in this case is the optic tectum, the two hemispheres, the neuropathia, the middle and parts of the cerebellum with signal cell resolution. We can also uh, scan or navigate using this microscope through the entire nervous system so we can go from dorsal to ventral and see uh, large portions of the brain. Still with single cell resolution, it's more tricky to see single events, but we still can uh, detect cells. In this case, we see the, um, the optic tectum of the midbrain, the cerebellum, and the hindbrain. We can focus in a specific region of just as the midbrain, where we can cross from dorsal to ventral. We can pass through the entire optic tectum we can, uh, here you will see the optic nerve soon. Here we reach the thalamus, and then we see the fasciculus reflexus here that will run here. That uh, projects from the avenula to the interpendicular nucleus, and this is the limit, the, almost the bottom part of the brain. Or see uh, regions uh, where we can see the telencephalon, uh, the avenula, the midbrain, in this case the optic tectum, the cerebellum, and parts of the vagal lobe in the hindbrain. 
So the system, uh, apart from the two-photon microscope, where we uh, embed the, uh, the larva in a drop of agarose, it's uh, only by its head, so the tail is free to move, or sometimes we can remove the agarose around the eyes and see the behavior of the eyes, the rotation of the eyes. The agarose is, um, has the same index of refraction as the water, so it's transparent and the, uh, porous enough so oxygen can diffuse freely uh, through the agarose and, uh, and the fish, uh, the larva can breathe uh, normally. We add to the system a miniature microscope below connected to a high-speed camera so we can record uh, in real time the kinematics of the tail and project uh, any sort of uh, uh, visual stimuli from uh, simple bars to natural uh, stimuli. We can now also close the loop between these two, between the motor behavior and the visual stimulus, so we can calculate the kinematics of motor behavior in real time, and from there calculate the uh, next position of the, of the larva and present uh, the visual stimulus accordingly so the, uh, the larva in agarose can perceive uh, the movement or get visual uh, feedback from their own motor behaviors. With the system, we can see, uh, for example, if we present to the larva moving bar, just uh, these two simple stimuli, I don't know if you hear. Can we turn on the lights, off the lights? We can see, uh, I don't know if you managed to see it, but you see waves across the optic tectum, suggesting that this, uh, the uh, optic tectum is retinotopically organized. And within the optic tectum, you can see if you look at single cells, you see that these cells, some of them, they show select, uh, selectivity for one specific direction, but not the others, and cells are uh, direction not selective at all. They respond very well to both directions and cells that respond to the opposite direction. And uh, so with these systems, we are trying, among um, other projects, we are uh, working on uh, the biological meaning of ongoing spontaneous activity. So we no all know that uh, in sensory areas, uh, also during uh, periods of uh, sensory deprivation. We see a lot of activity. Once this activity was thought to be just a uh, random noise, but now it's of course, among other work, demonstrated uh, here the work of Kenneth, uh, Ariely, and uh, Greenfield from Weizmann, demonstrated that it has a relevant structure. In this case, they looked at V1 in cats, anesthetized cats, where they compare uh, patterns of uh, spontaneous activity that spontaneously emerge in V1 and they saw that some of these uh, patterns match those induced by specific orientations of the stimuli. And see, if you create a map of these uh, orientations, uh, plus one on top of the other, coded by the color, so you see that this evoke and the spontaneous uh, maps look uh, similar. So from the spontaneous activity, you can reconstruct the evoked uh, patterns. So in zebra fish, we can do similar type of experiments, but in a preparation that it's uh, non-anesthetized, and uh, we can see the behavior and record from many portions of the brain. Uh, for today, we are focusing on the uh, optic tectum mainly uh, of the fish, which is the largest and highest uh, brain region in uh, Teolos fish. It receives, well, it's the parallel of uh, the superior colliculus in mammals, and it receives uh, most of the inputs from the retina. It sends uh, some of the outputs uh, to uh, motor centers in the hindbrain and uh, the control lateral tectum, also to the entelencephalon and the thalamus. And it's composed of mainly uh, gabarchic cells that form uh, recurrent connections within the tectum itself. So most of the neurons are interneurons. Uh, it's composed of 80,000 neurons in total at this stage, at eight days. Uh, and we can, uh, in the optic tectum, uh, we can find around 6,000 neurons. From those, we can uh, record at the same time uh, a fifth, more or less, of this. In parallel, we can record them also, almost all. And in, if we uh, take pictures like this, we can record in the serial half of the brain. Uh, 
two studies, spontaneous activity, we are uh, using the uh, following paradigm. We first, while monitoring uh, around 1,000 cells in the optic tectum, we present, we focus on the dorsal part of the optic tectum, and we present a battery of stimuli, uh, first uh, moving bars in the four orthogonal uh, directions to look for direction selective cells, and then dots of light at different uh, regions in the field of view of the larva to look for, uh, the, to map the receptive field. Then we record an hour of spontaneous activity in absence of any type of sensory stimulus and motor behavior. And at the end, we uh, remap the direction selective maps and the receptive fields. We do this uh, several times, every time at a different uh, layer in the optic tectum until we uh, reach the ventral part of the optic tectum. We do it at four days when the receptive fields the dendritic arbors and the behaviors are uh, mature already. So I'm going to ask you, mm -hmm. what's actually required? Not single spikes. We are uh, using uh, chick on three, and uh, the sensitivity is around three spikes. From two to three spikes, we start seeing activity. Um, below one, pi one spike is, uh, is impossible, two spikes, uh, probably not. And uh, under threshold uh, changes, of course, not. So uh, from the um, visually induced, uh, or from the stimuli, we can induce activities. I hope this time you can see it better. So if we present this moving bar, you see a wave propagating in this direction. Maybe not. And if we present a dot in a region of the field of view, you will see a cluster of cells here very clear responding to it. So this is uh, the type of activities we see. Uh, this is a raster plot where uh, every row represents a cell. Uh, we have time in the ax in x, x axis. And every dot, of course, represents uh, one calcium event. From uh, the experiments where presented <coughs> bars in the four orthogonal directions, up, down, uh, left, and right, we see that some of cells are very uh, selective to upward movements, for example, of this group of cells. Others show uh, responses uh, only for uh, left uh, movements. And when we look, since we are doing functional imaging, we can go back and see which, where these cells uh, are uh, placed within the tectum, within the uh, network. And we see that uh, for uh, direction selective cells, these are sparse uh, randomly sparse uh, within the tectum without showing any specific cluster or specific region. This is a raster plot that, we, uh, that shows activity induced by different uh, regions in the field of view, uh, flashes of light in different uh, regions in the field of view of the larva. So you can see that different uh, positions will activate different ensembles of networks. And if we look where these cells are placed, uh, are induced by a specific visual stimulus, uh, we see that, uh, if you can imagine that this is the screen in front of the larva, the larva is looking straight forward to this uh, point, and uh, each square represents a position of uh, the stimulus. For example, this one, uh, when the stimulus was presented in top left corner, uh, and each graph represents the position of the cells that activate, were activated by this, uh, the, this position in the field of view. As you can see, you see the retinotopicity very clear, similar to what you saw uh, with the wave, with the bar moving across the visual field. You see that uh, horizontal uh, position in the field of view is represented in this axis, like this. And the vertical axis is represented from dorsal to ventral. So that's why you cannot see in, at this point when the uh, stimulus was at the bottom of the screen, you can see very few responses because the, the layer that is responding to this specific region is a little bit more ventral than the one that we were looking for. So uh, here it's a little bit difficult to see, but if you look now at the ongoing spontaneous activity for one hour, uh, you see that there are synchronous calcium events once uh, every uh, several minutes. You, maybe you can see it clearly from this uh, 
the histograms of the uh, events. In, yeah, in the ab absence of uh, light and absence of sound. Uh, we can talk about after that, yeah. Uh, in terms of behavior, they, they behave once in a while, right? So uh, from the behavior, we can uh, have an idea if we can, t there's some people that talk about sleeping fish, but uh, we, we can talk about states maybe of uh, alertness. And uh, sometimes we see, we see periods where the fish behaves a lot and some periods where it's very silent. If you zoom in, uh, just uh, to show you, to give you an idea how does it look like, you see that uh, across these 700 cells, you see uh, periods that randomly appear. They don't follow any uh, specific uh, rhythm, but you see uh, a lot of synchronous uh, events, as you can see also here from the histogram of the activities. So to describe uh, data like this that has many, many dimensions, it's a difficult task, and uh, for that we have to use methods of the dimensionality reduction to be able to, uh, to, to work with. And therefore, uh, the first choice was uh, to use principal component analysis to reduce the dimensions from uh, thousands uh, to uh, 20 to 50, depending on the case, something that we can work with already, uh, in such a way that uh, in principal component space we represent the history of uh, the cell, so every, do, every dot represents one, the, his, the entire history of the experiment of one cell, such a way that two neighboring points are two cells that show uh, or covariate similarly. They show the same uh, history. But the problem is to categorize. Uh, we see a central cloud and we see excursions of cells that try to behave or they tend to behave similarly, but to ca categorize uh, these cells, it's, uh, it will be difficult in principal component space. And therefore, we use um, uh, factor analysis, more specifically uh, PROMAT, which enables to break this uh, independency between the uh, principal components and fit uh, axis. We, we can fit, uh, now we can break the obliqueness of the, of the, between the principal components and fit axis uh, different axes to each of these excursions where the variance, the largest variance is. And then uh, look at each of the axes as groups of cells. So another representation of this method is uh, uh, to make uh, the point a little bit more clear. Every row here represents one uh, PC, one principal component, and every dot is represented by a, a line that goes through all the uh, PCs. So here we can represent the entire uh, population of PCs. And as you can see from principal component space, there's no, uh, actually we cannot see any structure. But if after uh, doing the rotation analysis or structure analysis with PROMAX, we can see starting here, every row represents one axis and we can start seeing a clear structure in the data. So after using this method, we can convert a raster plot that looks like this, that it's, uh, except for synchronous calcium events, we cannot say much, to something that looks like, uh, more or less like this. Uh, from b below the red line, we see cells that belong to this uh, central cloud, that don't belong to any uh, group. But we see also uh, events now very clear of cells that tend to fire together. Mm -hmm. There are ensembles of cells, dynamic ensembles of cells, like these three, for example, or this, uh, this four here in red, or these two here. And as you can see, some of the uh, cells within an ensemble also uh, form part of uh, a different ensemble. Yes. Uh, so are these cells spatially close together? Yeah, in a second I will show. So there are cells that uh, belong just to a one, uh, one, one ensemble, but there are cells that can belong to different ensembles. Uh, and here you can see, I think for a long period of time, so it's something that continuously happens in the, in the optic tectum. It's not just a short period of time, but it uh, doesn't matter how long do you record, you see this uh, type of structure all the time. So uh, to answer your question, when we looked at where these ensembles are placed in the tectum, 
So we see that some of them, they're very close together. They uh, cluster together like this, like this. But some others, uh, they look more sparse. Some of them with a subcluster within it, but with many satellites around it. So to look, uh, to compare between the activity induced by visual stimuli and the activity uh, records spontaneously, we uh, plot the uh, following graph where uh, we put all the ensembles that we recognize from this uh, PROMAX analysis within the same graph and we code it according to the uh, ensemble number. So cells that uh, share the same color are cells that covariate uh, similar or share the same history. As you can see, you can see a degradé of uh, colors, suggesting that, uh, or like colors, for example, the reds, the uh, yellows, greens, and blues. Um, so suggesting that we see this uh, retinotopicity within uh, the experience where we present the stimuli. And to our surprise, we see that the uh, same phenomenon occurs during uh, spontaneous activity in absence of any sensory stimulation. And even it's a little bit more clear, I will show you afterwards, uh, suggesting that the clusters that we see during the uh, spontaneous activity are probably more packed or smaller than those induced by the visual stimuli. And this is just another an example. Um, so we could see uh, this similarity between the uh, visually induced activity for uh, different regions in the field of view, but when we looked at uh, the cells that respond to different uh, orientations, we couldn't find any type of ensemble that mimics within the uh, ongoing spontaneous activity the direction selective uh, neurons. Then the n next question was to try to see if these uh, ensembles that uh, emerge spontaneously during the ongoing spontaneous activity are those induced by the visual stimuli or are completely <coughs> different. They may have the same characteristics but could be completely different. And for that, we took the several trials where we present each of the different stimuli. We create a vector that uh, uh, represents the average across, across all trials. And that vector we use, uh, we made the uh, cross product, normalized cross product, through the entire uh, periods of the experiment. We can see, for example, that within this cluster, it was induced by a specific position in the field of view. Uh, not all cells look alike, but some cells that uh, higher higher activation strength or higher amplitude in the calcium event, and the delay, the time of activation also is uh, uh, at different time points. You can see it here also that if you organize it according to the delay, you see that there's uh, a curve. So this uh, result of the cross product through the entire uh, uh, trace, we normalize it in such a way that one, uh, we call it activation strength, and one will represent that all the cells that we were testing uh, that were induced by the uh, visual stimulus uh, are activated, but none outside this, class, this ensemble. Zero will represent all the cells within the optic tectum activated or none of them. And minus one will represent the, uh, a situation where all the cells in the, in the optic tectum are activated, except of those um, of the, uh, the activated by the visual stimulus. So when we check these uh, during the visual stimulus, we see strong activations of cord at the time point when the given visual stimulus is presented, but not for the others. And when we look at the uh, period of the ongoing spontaneous activity here between the green lines, we see uh, that at certain uh, time points without, within the experience, we see activations, meaning that a, a roughly representation of the cells activated by visual stimuli emerge spontaneously. Okay. If we zoom in, one of uh, you can see that this group of cells uh, look very similar to those uh, induced by the visual stimuli. Here to compare that this group of cells were induced by the visual stimuli in two cases, and here you see that the ensemble that spontaneously emerged looks very much like. Okay, so the next question was to uh, 
try to understand if this uh, emergence of uh, spontaneous ensembles that occur spontaneously and they mimic those induced by the visual stimuli, visual stimuli that represent the uh, entire visual field of view of the larva. Uh, they have a preference for any particular uh, position. For example, if there are uh, ensembles that, since we know we can correlate between the position or the angle around us, and the, uh, and the position within the optic tectum of the ensemble that responds to that position. So we can ask if these all positions uh, in the field of view are represented in the same manner or there's a preference for any particular one. And for that, we calculated the, um, uh, the preference direction for each of the cells uh, taken from all the presentation of the visual stimuli. So we created a Gaussian, we gave uh, to each cell a Gaussian, which is the average of the uh, responses to the uh, different positions in the field of view, and the width of the uh, Gaussian represents the standard deviation of the response. We coded here, so the color represents the, uh, the mean of the Gauss Gaussian, and the transparency of the cell represents the standard deviation. So from uh, first view, you can see that cells in the middle uh, across or along the, uh, the ventricle are more transparent than those outside this region, suggesting that these cells respond mainly uh, to all positions in the field of view, and those outside the, uh, or far from the ventricle, are more specific tuned. Here, I'm, uh, it looks all blue, but of course there are different degrees of blue, and we, uh, according to the Gaussians, we uh, managed to make for each of the experiments, for each fish, this type of uh, map. And we asked then for those ensembles that uh, spontaneously emerge, where th what's the frequency of appearance within this region, this region, or the others, okay? And we found that uh, for, then we uh, do the, did the sum of all these Gaussians that belong to a single uh, ensemble, and we plot the histogram. And we found that for, uh, that there are two peaks mainly, Okay, and uh, that represents uh, for around 45 to 50 degrees, suggesting that those ensembles that represent uh, a direction that is 45 degrees from the central line of the larva will have a tendency to appear in a random manner more than the others. And when we shuffled uh, all, the, uh, all the data, the, the data from the Gaussians and the cells, we obtain a uh, curve like this, suggesting that this is uh, much more significant than it looks like. This should be uh, the random uh, graph. Okay. To our surprise, we found a paper recently that appeared in Frontiers in uh, Neural Circuits where they did a similar experiment looking just at the behavior of the larva. And here you can see in this histogram, circular histogram, uh, they show uh, different positions around the larva, different dots, and they look how does the uh, larva respond to these uh, positions. And they, they found that usually they tend to respond much better, you see these peaks in the histograms, when the uh, position of the light was at 45 degrees, similar to uh, what we observed in the, uh, in the optic tectum in terms of ongoing spontaneous activity. And we are now using uh, uh, virtual paramecia, the, what the, uh, the larva feeds on. Uh, we are doing similar experiments where we see more or less the same uh, type of results. Then um, the next question was uh, to try to uh, understand if this uh, emergence of structure in the ongoing spontaneous activity is intrinsic to the uh, optic, tectum, optic tectum circuit or arrives uh, from somewhere else and it's reflected in the optic tectum. So the main input to the optic tectum is the retina. It's uh, around uh, 70 to 80% of the uh, inputs uh, right from the retinal ganglion cells. And uh, then so we looked, uh, we removed one of the eyes at five days in the larva. Uh, so we have in this, and we looked at four days, uh, we did the experience at four days of ongoing spontaneous activity. So within the same larva, we have the experiment and the control. So we have a tectum that is intact. The, in the in Cholos fish, the uh, innervations of the eyes to the tectum are control lateral only. There's no ipsilateral connections. So we have a tectum that has 
a normal connectivity to the eye, and a second spectrum that is uh, it has no connectivity, it's completely silence of, uh, of input. And we see that, of course, as expected, we see this uh, degradé or retinotopic uh, mapping in the optic spectrum that is in the image sphere that is intact. And when we look what happens in terms of ongoing spontaneous activity in the enucleated uh, tectum, the one that is lacking inputs, even the larva was three days in absence of any sensory stimulation, we can see still uh, the uh, retinotopicity. We see cells that are in red that are close together, those in yellow and green close together, and those in blue close together. This, uh, Synchronous calcium events uh, that show the emergence of uh, ongoing ensembles that represent different positions in the field of view. It's unique to the optic tectum. We couldn't find it even though in the telencephalon, for example, the precursor of the cortex. Um, we, although the, the activity was larger in, in average than the optic tectum, we couldn't see any structure and it, neither in the thalamus. Another advantage of the zebrafish larva is that uh, we can uh, image uh, in an intact uh, larva organism throughout de development. We can uh, start recording two, three days, up to uh, 15 days. And through this uh, period, uh, we can pass from, the, uh, from a time point where the tectum is uh, free of any inputs uh, before the retinal ganglion cells arrive to the tectum. At four days, uh, we start seeing optokinetic responses. By uh, day five, uh, we, the larva start uh, prey on paramecia, for example. And by day eight days, uh, the optic tectum is structurally and functionally uh, mature. So we looked um, at different parameters of this ongoing spontaneous activity throughout development at three, five, and eight days. We are now looking at 12 days, but not, uh, I don't have the results yet. And we see, for example, for a parameter, parameter indicating the lat laterality of the ensembles, how uh, restrained to one hemisphere or the other the ensembles are. For example, one will represent ensembles that are all localized in one hemisphere and not the other, and zero, 50, and 50% in both hemispheres. They all look alike throughout development. The same thing for the number of cells. There's no uh, significantly difference through uh, different days. The same thing, although there's a little bit of, or a tendency, but not significant, at uh, three days for the ensembles to appear a higher frequency. And then other uh, parameters that indicate uh, how uh, the ensembles are clustered, how close are together. I won't go into details for each, but all look alike. So it seems that during the uh, spontaneous activity, during development, these uh, characteristics of uh, the ongoing spontaneous activity remain stable from the beginning, even before the, uh, the main input of this section arrived. And finally, we start recording uh, now and doing analysis on the ongoing spontaneous activity and their correlation to the motor behavior. We can record both at the same time in absence of any sensory stimuli. So the arrows on top of this raster plot represent different uh, type of movements that we were able to characterize. For example, I cannot see from there, but well, you have to believe me that different left, uh, left turn, right turn, left escape. And I want you to uh, focus on this uh, big green arrow that the, uh, in contrast to the other uh, motor, be uh, motor behaviors is always associated, not always, but it's mainly associated with this uh, weird pattern of, uh, ongoing, sp of ongoing spontaneous activity across uh, these neurons. So every time that we see this pattern, it's always a uh, left escape response, but not always that we see a left uh, escape response, we see this pattern. So you can compute the visual interpretation of this pattern, can you? In which sense? Well, you, you, you know something about the activity of the neurons. Uh, yeah. We, we, we didn't yet. Uh, didn't do the, uh, the analysis yet, but uh, we can know much more than uh, just looking at the cells. We know the selectivity, the position, if they represent a different position in the field of view. And now we can, uh, soon we'll be able to know if this, uh, the identity of the cells, if they are GABAergic or uh, glutamatergic, dopaminergic, etc. 
Yeah, th these are results that uh, we obtained recently. Uh, we start in, we are in a very early stage. And uh, we, when you zoom in one of these events, you see that there are a group of cells that start firing in a ramping manner 10 or 12 seconds before the onset of the stimulus. That is very interesting for us because uh, the delay between the presentation of a stimulus until the uh, onset of the motor behavior is in average 500 milliseconds with a standard deviation of two, 300 milliseconds only. And here we are talking about uh, 10, uh, tenfold. Why do you say ramping? Does it seem uh, well, if you look closely, you see cells that start uh, firing, and then there are others that are recruited later. But 10 seconds or 8 seconds from the slow movement seems to be constant. From here, no, I mean from here, from Go here. Yeah, so uh, from here you have uh, 12, even 14, yeah, 16 I'm seconds. Part. Yeah, middle here, part. no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure, but uh, I think from here it doesn't seem to, uh, the ramping is uh, at the very beginning, but uh, of course the onset is not the end of the ramping in this case. There are also many events where there's no, there's ramping and no, no activity. Uh, like this? Well, I, I yeah. One second, I, I'll explain all this. Uh, so once the onset uh, of, the, uh, of the movement takes place, this uh, group of cells that uh, apparently predicted the movement, or we can predict the movement from uh, the activity, their activity, uh, they get silent, and another group takes over during the motion, during the motor behavior itself, and the groups that were firing before the onset of the stimulus start firing again, or at least a part of them, before they present, uh, before, uh, after the, the end of the movement. So uh, we still, we are not sure how to interpret uh, or understand this behavior, but it could be a kind of relay, a group of cells that have to increase the activity to deliver the, uh, or trigger the motor behavior, and they have to fire again in order to stop it. What about the, the movement during the fire? This? No. Here? Yeah. yeah. We don't know yet. Yeah, we we, did, we have. I obtained this uh, raster plot not a long time ago, and we didn't do uh, yet f further analysis. Okay, just to summarize, uh, I show you that ongoing spontaneous sexual activity shows a biological relevant structure that it represents uh, retinotopic information rather than directional selective information. Uh, the spontaneous emerging ensembles that match clusters activated by visual stimuli are of around four degrees uh, and are preferably uh, at the position of 45 degrees from the central line of the fish and seem to be more represented, uh, and these seem to be more represented than others, similar to what observed at the behavioral uh, level. This spontaneous activity structure may then represent local circuit attractors that may increase the signal to noise ratio uh, for stimulus detection in low contrast or cluttering backgrounds. We are testing this idea now by uh, using channel rhodopsin at the same time of calcium imaging. So the idea is to try to stimulate one or two of these cells that we found to belong to a certain ensemble, see that that's enough, what's the threshold, enough to uh, light up all the other cells around them within the optic, uh, within the ensemble. Um, um, since we can also look at evolution, uh, development during the, uh, during uh, of ongoing spontaneous activity, uh, we found that this ongoing activity structure is established in the tactile network even before the arrival of the visual inputs and remains stable through uh, development of the larva, suggesting a possible role in shaping visual induced responses. Because the uh, visual induced responses actually show a very large uh, change through uh, this period of development from three to eight days, where the um, receptacles, they get much, uh, they shrink, they get much smaller, and uh, also directional selectivity uh, rise. And from uh, this very preliminary data of uh, correlation or association between motor behavior and ongoing spontaneous activity, um, some of these dynamic ensembles predict uh, specific uh, self-generated motor behaviors and since the correlations were observed uh, between behavior and spontaneous activity have been found only in the optic tectum and no other so far 
uh, brain regions, such as the telencephalon or the thalamus, these patterns of neural activity could be interpreted as the source of internal decisions or specific, uh, specific in, uh, expectations. And we are now trying to uh, image very large uh, portions of the brain that, go, uh, that um, occupied uh, several uh, brain, four to five uh, different brain regions and try to understand how these uh, internal decisions or expectations are uh, generated and flow through the entire nervous system until they reach the motor centers in the hindbrain and generate the motor behavior. Okay, just I want to thank the, the students, especially uh, Sebastian, who is the one behind all this work, the collaborators and the funding agencies. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's the experiment that they are doing, Sebastian is doing right now. He uh, does the same battery of experiments, but before the ongoing spontaneous activity, he stimulates one uh, specific region in the field of view and see if the probability of seeing one of these ensembles that correspond to that particular region is to, um, has a preference or uh, the, the frequency of uh, emergence uh, increases. We don't know yet, yes. maybe in two months. Thank you very much.